So welcome everyone and I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, which is part of a series of webinars that the Academic Society of Engineers Ireland organise annually. And for anyone unfamiliar with the work of the Academic Society, we are a special interest group who promote the advancement of academic standards in engineering and facilitate and organize activities such as this one. Um, my name is Michelle Luby and I'm um, one of the members of the Academic Society and I'm also a senior lecturer in TU Dublin in the engineering school. So the Academic Society aims to develop and disseminate a body of knowledge for engineers working within the academic community and also serves engineering professionals with an interest in academic topics. So I'm delighted to have organized today's webinar along with fellow committee member, Dr. Patrick Flynn, who is here today and who will join us in moderating the questions and answers after the talks. So there's a question and answers box at the bottom of the screen for posting questions. So we'd ask you not to post them in the chat, but to use that special question, questions and answers box there at the bottom of the screen. So today's webinar is about Athena Swan, which is a charter launched in the Republic of Ireland in 2015 and which supports Ireland's national strategy for gender equality. The Charter provides an opportunity to transform equality through attainment of an Athena Swan Higher Education Award and all of Ireland's universities and institutes of technology participate in Athena Swan Ireland. So the webinar today will discuss the Athena Swan Charter as a framework for supporting and transforming gender equality within higher education and research and which provides a mechanism for education institutes to apply for Athena Swan Awards, which are in recognition of their gender equality efforts. So I'm delighted to welcome our three speakers here today, Sarah Fink from Athena Swan Ireland, Dr. Rena Cole from the University of Limerick and Professor Yvonne Galligan from TU Dublin and would like to thank them very much for being here and sharing their expertise and experience and I'll give some more information on each speaker just before their presentation. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Sarah Fink. Sarah is head of Athena Swan Ireland and has been working on the Athena Swan Charter since 2015, both within Advance HE and in the Irish sector, and who also has supported the expansion of equality charter frameworks across multiple countries. So Sarah provides sector-wide and institutional support on attainment of gender equality through the Charter, providing specialist knowledge and advice, developing training and workshops, and facilitating peer review assessment panels. So today, Sarah will talk on the importance of Athena Swan in higher education and about the role that Athena Swan Ireland plays in supporting higher education institutes in sustainable gender equality work. So very welcome again, Sarah. And Sarah is going to do her talk, which is entitled Athena Swan Ireland Perspective. So I'll hand over to you now, Sarah. Thanks so much, Michelle, and thanks for that introduction. Uh, so yes, as, as Michelle said, I'm going to talk about the kind of the perspectives of Athena Swan and, and, and our role here in, in Ireland. Uh, if you're not familiar, Athena Swan is a framework for addressing inequality in higher education and, and research institutions. And Michelle touched on some of this in her introduction. Applications uh, can be submitted by higher education institutions, but also by academic departments and professional units. It's based on a methodology of self-assessment, peer review, and continuous progression, and awards are conferred at bronze, silver, and gold in recognition of, of steps on your equality journey. So on this slide here, I have highlighted what the charter process looks like. So applicants undergo a peer period of self-assessment where they will identify kind of issues and challenges related to gender equality within, within their department, their institution, and within the discipline. Uh, you create an action plan that, that lasts for about four years to address those issues. And then over time, you evaluate how that activity is going and renew or upgrade your award depending on your progress and success. I did want to share a little bit about the, the charters and, and some more background about the journey in Ireland. So if, if you're not familiar, Advance HE is the organization who owns and operates the, the Athena Swan Ireland Charter and, and other equality charters around the world that you can see here. And what we say is that we want to develop charter programs that are both 
globally comparable with one another, but are also locally contextualized. And I'll say a little bit more about Ireland and its national contextualization journey that we've had since kind of 2014 or 2015. So Athena Swan Ireland was launched as, as part of a pilot uh, back in 2015 with funding support from the Higher Education Authority. And at that time, the focus was really on the underrepresentation of women academics in STEM disciplines. But we've seen a lot of kind of building capacity in the sector and the charter has evolved over time. Um, so in 2017, we, we expanded it to, to look to all disciplines in the sector, to include other staff working in, in institutions. So not just the focus on academics, but professional managerial support, technical staff as well. Um, we took a broader gender lens. So that means looking not just at the underrepresentation of women, but thinking about where, where men are underrepresented in particular disciplines, uh, the inclusion of trans and non-binary staff, and also starting to think about the intersection of of gender with other equality grounds. So thinking about in particular the, the intersection of gender with race and ethnicity. But when we got to 2020, there was, I think, a real feeling in the sector that Athena Swan had was in need of a refresh, essentially, um, to kind of respond to, to what we had learned over the last few years. So we consulted with the sector on developing a new framework. Um, and this framework is now in place, and all charter applicants will use that from from this month as they, as they apply for their awards. And I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the aims of that new framework and some of some of the issues that we wanted to respond to. So we heard from the sector that it's really important that Athena Swan can continue to drive impactful and sustainable gender equality work. And for academic departments who are applying for awards, you'll really see how the charter has retained a gender lens. But we also had feedback around Athena Swan being a, a sort of a focal point or a framework for being able to build capacity uh, in evidence-based interventions across additional equality grounds. Uh, this was partially about, you know, getting recognition for that other work and, and highlighting the importance of that other work, but also ensuring that our gender work is intersectional in its approach uh, and looks at how gender interplays with other equality issues as well. As I alluded to earlier, ensuring that we have a framework that includes all staff working in our institutions and departments, uh, regardless of, of grade or role or contract status. One of the things that we really wanted to do was make sure that the new framework kind of better aligned to some of the, the Irish national priorities, but also EU priorities. So, so for us, that this means aligning to sort of activity and recommendations and expectations that come from the work of the Higher Education Authority, making sure that it's keeping up to date with Irish legislation and Irish entitlements around, you know, family leave or gender pay gap reporting expectations, and then also making sure that Athena Swan action plans align to things like the Horizon Europe uh, requirements for gender equality action plans. So, so that if you're doing Athena Swan, you're meeting those expectations as well. One thing we also heard from the sector was that the charter needs to be effective and progressive and hold institutions to account on their equality work, but also that there was a need to kind of reduce the administrative burden of the charter. So we know a lot of work goes into the data collection uh, and other activities, the consultation piece that goes into the charter work. Um, so we did a lot of work to kind of rationalize what data sets were required, how many years was required. But also it wasn't just about a reduction in workload, but how that workload is valued and recognized in institutions. So we've built in kind of a new governance and recognition piece within the new application framework. So the institutions are considering how this work is resourced, how it's distributed across staff, that it's not falling, that the burden isn't falling on underrepresented groups or, or one particular person, and that this activity is built into the recognition frameworks in our institutions. So, so things like academic promotion or development reviews or, or other activities. I don't want to read out the new charter principles today, but I did want to highlight some of the key themes out of the new charter principles. Um, and, and you should know that whether you're an institution or a department applying for an Athena Swan Award, you're, you now have to 
have to commit to and sign up to these principles. The first set are around how the how the work is sort of committed to and and set up. Uh, so this is things like embedding EDI into your culture and, and decision making, uh, how you ensure active leadership from senior staff, that you're that you're collecting the right data, um, that you have that self-assessment piece, and, and that that work is distributed appropriately and, and formally recognized and rewarded. Some of the other themes are around making sustainable structural and cultural changes. Uh, often the way we talk about this, this principle is that it that you're making sure that you that you don't have sort of a deficit model approach in your equality work. So making making sure that you're, you know, you're not trying to kind of fix a particular cohort of staff, that you're thinking about sort of the wider structure or policy changes that, that are needed. Um, tackling behaviors that detract from safe and respectful and supportive environments, uh, addressing unequal gender representation across academic disciplines and, and professional, some professional and support functions as well. Uh, there's a point about intersectionality in there. And then the, and the final principles are around this issue with precarity and the impacts of short-term and casual contracts, uh, supporting flexibility and maintaining a healthy whole life balance. Apologies, I'm in a hotel and there's some people screaming outside the window. So sorry if you're picking up that sound. Uh, and then the final is around um, supporting trans and non-binary people in our institutions and departments. So you can see on the slide here that the growth of Athena Swan uh, award holders. Uh, we have 20 institution awards and, uh, and 94 departmental awards. Two, most of these are bronze. We have two silver award holders, one of which is in engineering. And you can see here on the slide, there is really good engagement from uh, the various schools of engineering and departments across the sector. Um, so you can see the, the bronze awards here and then um, the University of Galway's silver award as well. And we were, we were celebrating a few of these yesterday at the, the awards ceremony. Here I have kind of a, an overview of what the criteria looks like for each award level. Um, we have developed underpinning principles for each criteria now as part of the new framework that gives a little bit more detail around expectations for, for hitting these. But what you can see is that the criteria is additive. So as you build on your work, you're still expected to hit the, the bronze criteria as you work your way to upgrading to silver and then to gold. And I did also want to touch on some of the required data and consultation themes as part of the new framework. So on the, the left of the slide and in, in the blue box, um, you can see the, the data collection that is expected. Um, some of this data is a, a one year snapshot of, of data, but others is three years of trends related to, to student and staff populations. We've also done some work to support what you would consult with your with your community about, and some of these sort of tie into the population themes. So things like experiences of promotion or, or career progression opportunities and career development, um, but also there's more space for kind of the, the cultural themes, the culture and inclusion and belonging themes in departments. And, and the, these relate to things like the values and traditions of a department, um, different, different practices and behaviors, and things like flexible working opportunities and family leave. A lot of schools will be at the stage where they're thinking about renewing their bronze award. Um, so I did want to touch on the purpose of, of the renewal application. So another part of the the new charter framework is that we have uh, developed a kind of lighter touch renewal application. And really, it's an opportunity for, for you to understand and reflect and demonstrate your progress to date and also determine priorities and actions for the future. So you'll find that when you're renewing your Athena Swan Award, it, it isn't the, the full application process again. Instead, it's it's more about providing a, a an updated progress report on how your action plan has been going. Uh, and I've provided a link to the, the, new, the new framework documents there. And just to say, get, please do get in touch anytime. I know there's space for questions at, at the end of today, but just thanks so much for, for having me.
Thanks so much, um, Sarah. You've really given a great insight there into what Athena Swan Ireland does and the support, guidance and structure being provided to academic institutions through the Athena Swan Charter in the attainments of the awards. Very interesting to look through what you described as the gender lens across all sectors and consider intersections of gender in achieving what you, you, you describe as that impactful and sustainable gender equality work. I think you know the, the fact that it's sustainable is so important. And it's fantastic to hear about the engagement across all the different educational institutions. So thanks very much for that, Sarah. Our second speaker is a Dr. Rena Cole. So Rena is an Athena Swan champion in the School of Engineering in the University of Limerick. Rena is a lecturer in mechanical engineering in the school and is also the assistant dean for academic affairs in the Faculty of Science and Engineering. She has led the School of Engineering Athena Swan team since 2017 and is a committee member of the Engineers Ireland Academic Society. Today, Rena will talk about the achievement of an Athena Swan Bronze Award in University of Limerick and how this has been embedded within the School of Engineering. So very welcome again, Rena. And Rena's talk is titled the, Un the University of Limerick School of Engineering Athena Swan Journey so far. Thanks very much, Michelle. Uh, it's, it's great to, to talk about this again, because I, I suppose I, um, from, from working in it over the last five years, I would uh, think of myself as a champion and I think it, it's a, a really good uh, it's been a good journey so some in 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 uh, um, in general some some highs some lows but overall um, it's great to see how uh, trying to um, increase our gender balance in engineering has has really progressed in the last five years but also um, uh, as uh, Sarah was saying there how uh, it, it's been widened now not just to look at gender um, and and that's slowly happening i think and, and hopefully that, that will gather pace as we go so um i suppose uh, just talk a little bit about where we are within the 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 institution um i spoke on this um about a year ago as well and we were we were still at an earlier stage of, of the journey and um, back then um there was we were one of of a number of departments that hadn't received a bronze award yet but at this stage um all bar one department or unit in the University of Limerick has a bronze award and as Sarah said our physics uh, department have a silver award and the institution is going for um, a, a, a silver award as well um, in, in the coming uh, in this cycle. Um, so uh, y y over the last five years um, well, over the last five years that I've been involved this has really um, uh, been embedded within the University of Limerick. So in uh, April 2017, the school um, self-assessment team was set up. Um, I was asked to lead it. Uh, we worked very hard and we put in a bronze submission in, uh, 20, in November of 2017. And uh, we found out the following April that it was unsuccessful. And you know, we put a lot of, of, of work into it. But, um, so it was very disappointing. But uh, I suppose also reflecting on it now wasn't hugely sur surprising because it had been, um, you know, it was it was just done in 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 that quick sort of six month period. Uh, so we uh, licked our wounds for a while and then we started working on it again properly um, over the academic year, sort of uh, 2019, uh, 2020, um, do, serving students, serving staff over the summer of 2019, gathering all of the information, consulting with, with um, all of the relevant people. And then COVID hit and actually we got the news of COVID. We had an all day meeting uh, where different parts of our team were coming in on the 12th of March uh, to work on different parts of the document because we were aiming to get it in that, that April. Um, and we were due to get it to um, our, some internal reviewers within a week or so. And then we heard the announcement um, from Leo Rikers. So um, with one thing and another, it really, really um, impacted on our, our work um, to, to resubmit. So um, this group here was just before all of that happened and uh, it was great because we had a really good strong student cohort in there, uh, both at undergraduate level and postgrad level. And what happened then in, in trying to resubmit, is, is because a lot of the work was done online, um, we drove forward predominantly with, based on, on the work we had gathered and, and, and the work of those students, but also um, uh, we 
it was predominantly staff that were working on it. So um, we submitted in June 2021, um, got a request for resubmission in, in November of, of 2021. Um, and this is the group um, that were working very hard on it um, at this time. Uh, unfortunately, then we, we got notification that really there was still a little bit more work that needed to be done. So we resubmitted um, uh, in February, uh, just gone. And uh, finally, in April, um, we, we got notification that we were awarded and was delighted to attend yesterday um, at the ceremony and to uh, receive our, our lovely award, which is, is actually a physical award. It's, it's lovely to meet people um, uh, again under the circumstances we've been operating in the last few years. And also in the, the picture is um, the team from electronics and computer engineering with Confirm who also uh, got their, their award. Uh, uh, yesterday. So we've been working on, on implementing all of our actions. So uh, we're still meeting. Um, oh, we st so far, we've still been meeting online. So there's one of our earlier meetings. And thankfully, we have some students um, back working with us now, which is great. So two of the students that are here, um, Ashling is the um, president of the YSTEM uh, Society, uh, so Women in Science, uh, Technology, Engineering, Maths um, uh, Society, uh, and is a third year engineer, and Emma is also involved with that society, and she's a postgrad, and Emma was on um, our previous SAT as a, as a, a uh, postgrad, uh, sorry, as an undergraduate rep, and she's now there as a postgrad rep, she's doing a PhD. Um, one of the things we, we were trying to do is just really get the girls mixing earlier so we we invited uh, all of the first year girls to um, a coffee morning and unfortunately we didn't have a huge amount of turn up um i also have some fourth years in that picture as well um but i think trying to to build networks is really important and one of the things that i've spoken with um Ashley and emma about is, is about trying to build a buddy system for first year engineers so these are all actions that we're we're working through but i suppose just to go back to to part of our journey, um, you know, we're a very large school um, of engineering. I'm, I'm sure similar to other schools of engineering in, in the other institutions. Um, but in looking at our profile uh, when we submitted, um, we had 53 academics, 46 researchers, 23 technicians, five admin, just a very big school. And in terms of, of where we sit within the institution, uh, the School of Engineering had 11% um, of all of the undergraduate um, students within um, in, in that academic year. So we're, we're a very big um, part of the university. And unfortunately, um, what we have here is, is comparing our School of Engineering percentages with Science and Engineering faculty and then UL. Um, and just to note that the, this is a three-year average and it, ju it just happened to work out that that it was exactly 50% male and female in the whole institution. And I, I did query that because it just seemed too good to be true, but it, it's, it's just the way the three-year average did work out. So um, the average across the institution is 50% within science and engineering, it's 31%. And um, unfortunately in, in, in School of Engineering, it's, it's only 14% in, in that three-year period. Now it, it is increasing um, our intake, um, uh, balance um, is increasing so do hope to see that number increase uh, but it, it's um, we've we've had you know a mix we, we dropped down and around the time that we submitted our first award it, it had actually reached the lowest amount at 11 percent but thankfully it has been increasing and, and I'd like to think that this increase since 2016 2017 is, is something to do with all of the work that we've been putting in um, but we have seen a, a marked increase so back in 2020-21 we did have um, just under 16 percent of, of women in all of our undergraduate programs but we have problems in a number of different programs. So um, construction and management engineering is low, mechanical engineering and, um, and civil engineering. And then on the other side of that, we have biomedical engineering. Um, and it, it could go into a whole other talk on that. But uh, a lot of this uh, from our surveys um, and from what we can see is, is I think, due to perception um, and perception of, of people that, that, are, that are sort of the key uh, guidance people for our students that are coming in. But we can come back to that maybe. Uh, so in terms of postgrad numbers, they're sort of static around 15% um, and researchers, um, it's much better. So what we do find is that the girls uh, that are the women that we do have do tend to stay on um, to do PhDs. 
um, in greater numbers. Uh, in terms of flexible learning programs, there's been a huge increase in that as well, which is great to see that in 2021, nearly 40% of all of the part-time students in these flexible learning programs were, were women. Again, um, I suppose that was over the COVID period, which may or may not have implications for it. So for us, I mean, Athena Swan is all about what's happening with staff numbers, what's happening with our students and role models um, are really important for both staff and for students and the overlap then with outreach and trying to give a good TY experience and school visits. Now, they were very much impacted over COVID as were open days and a little bit also explore engineering, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, uh, so explore engineering used to be called Limerick for engineering and um, uh, University of Limerick is involved in this. It's driven, it's industry driven, um, but there's a brilliant showcase and thankfully we did showcase again back in May 2022. Um, and the, the photo with the engineering text is from that. So it's a really good way to, to literally showcase engineering um, because the companies are there showing um, what they do and the types of people that they need to work there. And this is engineering at all levels from apprenticeship up to, to, to level 10. One of the other things we did after starting this journey is, is to create a, a Twitter account to just get out the information of what, what we're doing as a School of Engineering, but really highlight, highlighting anything we're doing in terms of, um, of women in engineering. We're also part of, um, as part of Explore Engineering, uh, we also helped drive uh, the Inspire event in 2022. And Emma here um, on the right is, is one of our, our SAT members that I showed. I'm, I'm here on the left. And it, it was bringing TY students um, and, in the, and this year, fifth year girls as well in to hear from uh, engineers at different stages in their career. So Emma was at sort of student, postgrad student level. Ashling Hahasi there, some of you may recognize, she was civil um, engineer of, uh, um, sorry, charter, civil engineer of the year, charter engineer. She's won an award <laughs> anyway. And uh, Ashling's talk was absolutely amazing. And then we also had uh, people at different stages, two other women at different stages in their careers. And it was a great way to inspire uh, more women to do, um, to do engineering. So, um, you know, our actions um, come under, we have a lot of actions, they come under a number of different goals. Um, I'm happy to talk about any of those. Uh, we're working through these now uh, as part of our journey with a view to, you know, showing how we've made some changes and, and, and aim for the silver award as Sarah was talking about. So I suppose the key thing is we have a lot done, but there's more to do to paraphrase a politician from a, a number of years back. Um, and um, I may have to leave before the questions are finished. So if I miss any questions, please do feel free to contact me. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Rena, and congratulations to UL on a great achievement in attaining the Bronze Award and across so many schools in the university. Very interesting to hear about the journey in attainment of the award, and it is really so important to have champions like yourself to drive this, so it's really important. And very interesting to hear about how this has been embedded into the School of Engineering in a sustainable way, and how students and staff are involved. So it was lovely to see the teams involved in your presentation, really nice to see those photos. Great to hear that the stats are showing improvement in many areas within the school, and thanks very much for sharing some of the really good initiatives that the school is doing to create awareness about and bring girls into engineering. Um, and it's so important, that, you know, that that perception that you talked about for people coming in. So you've given lots of ideas and insights there for other institutions to draw on. So thanks very much for that, Rena. No problem. Thanks, Michelle. So finally, um, I'd like to introduce our third speaker, Professor Yvonne Galligan. So Yvonne is Director of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion and Professor of Comparative Politics in TU Dublin. She is also Founding Director of the AIB Research Centre on Inclusive and Equitable Cultures in TU Dublin. Yvonne is Chair of the Athena Swan National Committee and she was Founding Board Member of the European Journal of Gender and Politics. Yvonne's recent publications include Women MPs in Northern Ireland, Challenges and Contributions, 1953 to 2020, and also a publication on Delivering Gender Justice in, in Academia Through Gender Equality Plans, Normative and Practical Challenges. So very interesting work there from Yvonne. Today, Yvonne will talk about the achievement of an Athena Swan Bronze Award in TU Dublin and the process of building agreement on and shared ownership of a gender equality plan. So very welcome again, Yvonne. 
And Yvonne's talk today is titled From Dialogue to Consensus, Developing Athena Swan in a University. So Yvonne, if you'd like to share your presentation there. Thank you very much, Michelle. And um, thank you, Patrick, for both of you for the invitation to speak today um, and also to Engineers Ireland. Um, I um, I would like to speak about, um, about the institutional um, development of an institutional Athena Swan plan. Um, so I'll begin by saying that um, on November the 8th this year, yesterday, TU Dublin received an institutional Athena Swan Bronze Award at an Athena Swan Ireland's award ceremony held in the Atlantic University of Technology in Castle Bar. Our School of Mathematics also received a bronze award. The occasion was a joyous one as it celebrated the achievements of 32 applicant teams in making meaningful progress on gender equality. Behind um, this gala event is actually a journey for each institution. And in these times, as previous speakers have said, the journey was complicated by the COVID-19 pandemic. For TU Dublin, the journey was further complicated by the integration process underway since 2019, when three separate higher education entities founded the first technological university in Ireland. From this point, TU Dublin was focused on building a common culture from three separate cultures each with their own individual trajectories and forms. So we had um, quite a challenge to build a consensus around an institutional Athena Swan application and plan. But whatever the circumstances, be it in the University of Limerick, as we've just been hearing about, be it in TU Dublin, be it in any um, uh, higher education institution, developing a gender equality plan follows a relatively predictable path, beginning with prioritizing the action, then having an iterative dialogue, and finally to shared ownership and commitment to see the plan through. This is not a sterile process, even though the phases seem very logical and predictable. But instead, what happens is a wide ranging discussion on institutional culture and practice opens up. Everything is on the table, from an examination of institutional values, assumptions, policies and practices, to the formulation of solutions, articulating these solutions as concrete actions, and taking decisions about what is realistic, what is feasible, and what is the right thing to do. So in TU Dublin, we already had achieving an Athena Swan Award as a strategic aim with sequential timelines to 2030 for obtaining bronze, silver and gold institutional awards. And it was very helpful to see uh, Sarah's earlier mapping out of what that would entail. Um, I'm going to pass that particular slide on to my senior colleagues so that they're in no doubt as to the commitment required. But nonetheless, we were fortunate in having already got leadership support for our Athena Swan um, application and that this was stitched into the priorities of the university. And they, over the next um, number of years, will provide benchmarks for measurement of progress. Thus, when the strategic priority was actioned in the first stage, through developing terms of reference for an institutional um, working group, it already had senior leadership support. Then the working group and a wider self-assessment team was formed through an open call for interest. The open call was seen as an important confidence building measure, as it meant that anyone with any interest in the issue could make the case for being part of this group, obtain their line manager's approval for their commitment in this regard, and present their application. In addition, 
the criteria on which the applications would be evaluated were clearly presented in this call and the general range of skill sets required for this task was made very clear and explicit as part of the documentation. So following the evaluation of applications, a working group of 19 persons was formed. And from this, five people took responsibility for convening subgroups on key areas. And these key areas were um, policy, communications, data, and organizational culture. The remaining applicants were then encouraged to select their preferred subgroup. This brought the entire Athena Swan evaluation team to 44 and comprised a good cross-section of the university, um, in, including people from professional services, people at all levels and grades, um, postgraduate students. We didn't on this occasion have undergraduate students, but we had postgraduate students and postdoctoral um, um, uh, awardees with us as well. Now, this might sound like a very large team to manage, um, but we were just forming our university and it was important for us to have a transparent process and an, and an inclusive and diverse team to go through the Athena Swan process uh, application itself. The full team was in place in May, 2020. And we never expected to be working in COVID conditions for almost two years. Nonetheless, uh, the work of data gathering, investigating policy implementation gaps, evaluating the working culture, and communicating the ongoing work to the university community got underway. This included a staff survey on gender equality issues. It included holding 11 focus groups to dig more deeply into the findings of uh, the staff survey. It involved interviews with managers in different areas and uh, across uh, different disciplines, as well as with managers in professional services. It involved quantitative data extraction, collection and analysis, along with qualitative data extraction, collection and analysis. The activity was coordinated and managed by the EDI directorate and specifically um, my colleague, Dr. Noreen McNamara, uh, uh, put a huge amount of work into that coordination. So by the time we had a draft application together, the areas requiring action were quite clear. At that point, we began to test out some possible solutions or measures to address the various action areas. At this point, consultation with people in key positions, for example, heads of school, human resources, learning and teaching leaders, etc., these became very important touch points for us to get feedback uh, on the plan developed by these 44 people. We got valuable feedback on possible actions to address the problems. And we also were given an additional layer of nuance and understanding to the gaps our analysis had identified. Then the application and the draft action plan was presented to the university executive team. Feedback um, from the executive took place over three rounds of discussion and iteration, both on a collective basis and uh, often a one-to-one -one basis. And this brought buy-in from the top leadership to the action plan. It also resulted in the identification of four institutional priorities from the 50 plus actions proposed. Um, and these uh, four institutional priorities are a commitment to achieve a 40% gender balance at all decision-making levels from head of school upwards by 2025, which is quite a stretch target for us, but I'm sure we'll do our best to reach it. 
um, streamlining the supports in the university for those taking and returning from maternity leave, because if there was any issue that came through all the um, investigations that we conducted was the need for addressing glitches in the system in respect of maternity leave and maternity returns. Um, a third priority action was that 40% of schools will apply for an Athena Swan Bronze Award by 2025, and 40% of schools is 10 schools, so there's a lot of work ahead. And the fourth one in a really uh, important area is that in the faculties where there is a critical deficit in the gender ratio, and the uh, two faculties are engineering and the built environment, and the digital and data faculty. A faculty Athena Swan application is to be prepared and submitted by 2025. So trying to get really below the surface of the culture in these faculties to try and address some of the really knotty questions that uh, Rena has just been discussing in terms of uh, the School of Engineering. In addition, an annual uh, report on equality, diversity and inclusion will be prepared, will track the progress to date and will be a publicly available document. So by the end of the process, the Athena Swan application and action plan was a document that represented a consensus on the way forward in addressing gender inequalities. It involved a continual discussion in multiple forums to achieve that consensus. And you can imagine that this wasn't necessarily a very straightforward process because in terms of changing an institution and in terms of changing a culture, one always meets resistance along the way. And one also needs to be very well prepared with um, rationales as to why we are changing the way things have always been. Um, but now we have agreement around it and our Athena Swan Action Plan is now at the implementation stage and we look forward to reporting on the progress that we made uh, around it in next year and the years to come. So I think I leave it there and uh, allow people to um, have a discussion and to uh, maybe raise questions and I'm very happy to answer them. Thanks so much Yvonne and that was really insightful talk and congratulations to TU Dublin on achievement of the Athena Swan Bronze Award. It was lovely to hear that the three speakers met yesterday at the the awards ceremony in Castle Bar so that was quite coincidental that the two events were back to back. Um, so very interesting to hear about the journey and attainment of the award and plans going forward. And you've given a really detailed and useful account about the process undertaken. So again, lots of really good ideas and insights for others to draw on there. So thanks very much for that, Yvonne. So we've now heard from all three speakers and I'd just like to thank each of you again for really interesting and thought provoking presentations. And Patrick and I have been checking the questions coming into the Q&A box. So Patrick, I'd like to hand over to you now to give us the first question and see, see what people are asking. Yeah, we're just waiting for a couple more questions to come in. So can we begin by asking maybe the same question of all of you at different levels, like in terms of what was interesting about the presentations, as Rini talked about a school level, you've only talked about particular problems when you have a number of different institutions with their own cultures coming together, which is something I think a lot, a lot of people today will be facing. And Sarah, you looked at the overall picture. So I suppose what this is about is helping or assisting people achieve Athena Swan. So if you could briefly give, I suppose, the main pitfalls that you've seen in the process and the main tips you'd give to someone who's just starting or a team that's starting out. So I might maybe put that question, first of all, to you, Sarah, at the overall level of achieving Athena Swan. Yeah, thanks. I think that's a really good question. Um, I think one thing that I would say for academic departments in particular is making sure that they are thinking about how their work aligns to their institutional Athena Swan plans as well. So all the institutions are required to have Athena Swan action plans, and there is 
hopefully within those action plans, a lot of foundational work that would be needed to help support academic departments. And that might be with data collection, that might be with resourcing or support, but there also might be a lot of shared challenges locally within the discipline that are also reflected more widely across the institution. I think as well, where we are starting to see clear examples of impact, like improvements in the academic pipeline and in gender representation, Although we're seeing those locally within physics and engineering departments, I think a lot of that has been because institutions were willing to change policies and processes to enable some of that local impact. So I think there's, it's really about kind of working together between the institutional self-assessment teams and the departmental self-assessment teams. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Yvonne, I guess I could ask the same question of yourself, if that's okay. Like, basically, you've just gone through a process where you dealt with a very difficult situation of different cultures coming together. You had to then, as you talked about, establish those priorities. Again, there'll be other universities who are newly formed about to go through exactly the same process. So what would you advise and what tips would you give on what would you kind of pitfalls, I suppose, you allowed them to? Uh, thank you, Patrick. Yes, and, uh, and reflecting on it, I think... Um, rather than doing it, I think is a very interesting exercise in itself, just reflecting on it. Um, I think what we were very careful to do was to ensure that there was, uh, that in our, our um, Athena Swan self-assessment team or the whole evaluation team, that we had representatives from all three founding members, that it wasn't dominated by one institution with only a token member from uh, one of the other two in, uh, founding members. So, so we made a huge effort to ensure that insofar as possible, there were a number of, um, of people coming from the, uh, all of the founding members and that not one member swamped it. So that was the first thing. I think the second thing um, that I would um, say is that we also made a, a very strong effort to ensure that the team was balanced in terms of uh, male and female. So we did have a, have a 40 60 gender ratio on our panel. Um, not, um, not easy because it required actually uh, encouraging men whom we knew to be supportive of gender equality to actually come forward and consider being part of this group. Um, and in addition, we were also careful to, um, to ensure that the group had other diversities among them, some of whom people were happy to state, others we were aware of, but were unstated, but we knew that certain other perspectives were being included. Um, and I think the key thing in doing that is taking time to set up the Athena Swan Institutional Committee and build trust within that team. And that team will begin to build trust when they begin the work together. And I think there's nothing that uh, that's a substitute for actually working together around some of the knotty problems. Great, thanks Yvonne, great advice there. Um, again, Rena, I suppose I'm just pushing that question to your way as well, because your experience you talked about today was about the school level, and it's the same thing. Again, there's a lot of schools across all the universities are now looking to see how can they achieve Athena Swan. Again, you could talk about the pitfalls, you could talk about maybe the, the positives, and, and I suppose things that tips you'd give them as they're just starting out this journey. I would, and actually, there's a question from Una that's come in there about, uh, yeah, about I saw that, along those lines. Yeah. <laughs> <It's been laughs> so, um, I, I suppose, I think in, in the first instance, and it's changed now because the new charter, um, it's not as, um, I wouldn't say data is still important, but it's not as as uh, as reliant as before is it's fair to say sarah that it, it it's it's um it, it's been they, they've taken on the feedback because the biggest issue was was for us was data we in 2017 we had just amalgamated as a school the previous year so and we had amalgamated from a number of different departments and some of those departments 
hadn't just come into the school, they, they'd actually split. So when we got data from HR, it was it was supposed to be anonymized that we had to get names because you could see it was just the, it, there was huge issues and that was with staff data. Um, so I think that was the big problem. We I ended up spending so much time on, on, on the data that we, we uh, and writing the report that the action plan was very much an afterthought. Um, and um, I think that was our, our key problem. Uh, the first time around. Second time around, um, our action plan was better, but it was still it was still not good enough. I mean, I, I, I suppose Mike learning from even the, the iterative, iterative approach when we, we presented the second time, which became a second, third and fourth time, was um, it was just about being very specific in the action plan. And it, but that's great now because it's very helpful now that we're implementing it, that we, we know what we're supposed to be hitting. So I think they're the key things is just don't underestimate the data. I would also say get your color scheme right from the start so that you don't have to go back at the end and change all your charts so that, you know, you tell if you've got different teams working on staff and on students and whatever, you've decided what what colors you're using for what years, what colors you're using for what genders or, or whatever you want to do. But just so that the people that are doing the individual work produce the same uh, quality or qual uh, type of, of chart. So then it doesn't become a big job for the person who was putting it uh, into the document to, to fix uh, and, and, and lose a lot of time. Uh, and the action plan, just don't leave it till the end. That would, would be the key thing. Thanks, Rina. I think as you said, you, you picked up on Una's question in the chat so far. Um, if it's okay, could I ask a specific question in your presentation now? So, I mean, Sarah, just starting with you, I mean, you talked about, I suppose, the European context in relationship to Horizon Europe. I suppose, like again, as we've outlined today, it is quite a lot of work in putting this application together and also then ensuring that the actions are carried out. Is there an overlap between, I suppose, the European version and what Horizon Europe is looking at and what Athena Swan is looking at? Or, and I suppose, looking to the future, is there any proposal to develop a European wide approach which would incorporate Athena Swan? Is that all right? Yeah, great, great question. Thank you for that. So yeah, in terms of alignment tries in Europe, I think we kind of lucked out in some ways with the timing of the redevelopment of the new Ireland Charter because we were able to make sure that it adhered to some of the to, to, to all the requirements really of, of Horizon Europe. So those gender equality action plans are sort of two sets of requirements. One relate to the, the process related requirements in developing a gender equality action plan. So that's things like making sure it's a publicly facing document that is reported on and signed off by senior management. Things like that are built into the Athena Swan process, ways of how you collect data, that sort of thing. The other part of Horizon Europe is what they call their um, kind of content related requirements of their gender equality action plans. And those five themes uh, related to gender equality, things like leadership, um, addressing sexual harassment and, and violence in education, those things are linked directly to Athena Swan. So if you're doing Athena Swan, you're hitting those content related requirements of your, your action plan. So I, I'm pleased to see that there is um, that we have that alignment now. I think that's really important for, for resourcing, but also just in terms of, you know, hitting the big themes around gender equality. For having a, a European wide approach, there's a lot of, we've been part of a lot of working groups that look at having a European wide charter. And I, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not quite sure where we are with that. At Advance HE, we often get institutions from various countries around Europe or, or countries in themselves who approach us about developing a charter. What we have learned is that they do take a lot of national contextualization, um, depending on everything from how much data is available to sort of local legal requirements, but also just institutions will have their own priorities and themes. So maybe someday, but I'm not sure yet. <laughs> And um, I had a question then as well, if if I can come in there. Um, so how difficult is it to get that diversity of engagement within, within the process and, you know, to apply that gender lens that was spoken about across that intersection of gender? How, how difficult is that? I know diversity was coming up a lot in the talks. So I'd like to ask both of you, actually. Do you want me to start? Yeah. 
the, the, the intersectionality piece you, you mean? Yeah, so I think this is a real challenge, I think, for institutions, and we've really shifted our approach and how we ask about it. Um, so I talked a little bit about the journey of the charter, and in kind of that 2015 to 2017 period, we came out and asked institutions to start providing um, data and reflection and action on the intersection of gender with race and ethnicity. And what we found is that no institutions could kind of provide that data to us. And, and for us, this meant working with the Higher Education Authority to start to figure out how we laid some of the groundwork and support Support so that institutions could start to collect that data, um, kind of in increase disclosure rates. And now for departmental applications and, uh, and the institutional application, we've taken a little bit more of a narrative approach. So we've tried to align data and expectations to what, what the HEA is working on, but working with departments to start thinking about how do you raise awareness of these issues? What data do you think you need to start collecting to look at this in the future? It's really about sort of laying the groundwork for kind of future facing work, because I think, yeah, I think there's still a lot of work to do there. Yeah, thanks very much, Sarah. Yeah, that's really important. And Yvonne, if, do you, would you like to give your perspective on that? Yes, and I, I agree with uh, Sarah. I mean, uh, in bringing an intersectional perspective on to a gender equality um, approach um, needs um, careful thinking about. And we, we try to do that mostly through our focus groups. That was one of the reasons we conducted the focus groups in the first instance. So, and the reason we had so many, because we wanted small groups um, um, and we wanted particular profiles um, and we uh, also wanted to enable some of those to be intersectional. So, for example, we had an exclusively um, uh, black and ethnic minority women's uh, focus group to, to enable them speak with, um, with some um, safety, you know, having a safe space for them to speak about issues. And as we went through um, the focus groups, um, a couple of people would declare their, um, their sexual identity, for example, or other people would declare their positionality, for example, as carers or, um, or other, other issues. Um, so, so that's how we try to bring out the data around around it in a qualitative way and then build it into the analysis that we uh, were presenting in the application as a seamless part of the application um, but i think i think sarah's right it's not so much people ticking boxes saying you know i uh, i am declaring that i have a disability i'm declaring this that and the other it's about gathering the um, gathering in a safe space the views of people who have those perspectives on the workplace and on the world and integrating those ideas mm. that they come forward with yeah it's it's so important isn't it that everyone has a voice you know just listening to you here guys we could i could listen to you for a long long time but unfortunately we're just coming to the end of our webinar and just myself and patrick would like to thank you all on behalf of the academic society and engineers ireland for being with us here today it's been you know really insightful and you've given us so much to think about so thank you very much